all of your questions in the chat while they speak. All questions will be answered as time permits at the end of the final presentation. Myself and Inmanika Dean will be your moderators for today, and we will be checking the chat constantly for new questions. But first, let me introduce our members of the panel today. So we have Dr. Deborah Newberth. She has a master's degree from the University of Northern Colorado and a doctorate degree in audiology from the University of Florida. She began practicing audiology in 1991 as the first Bahamian audiologist at the Red Cross Center for the Deaf. Currently, Dr. Newberth has her own practice, Newberth Hearing Services in Thompson Court, Oaksville. Then we have Ms. Sharon Clark. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in speech pathology and audiology and a Master of Arts degree in communication science and disorders. Recently appointed as the acting director of education responsible for the special services section, she has 40 plus years of experience in the field of speech language pathology. Ms. Keva Ferguson, has a Bachelor of Arts degree in elementary education and a Master of Education degree in communication disorders. A former trained, formerly trained educator, she spent seven years in the classroom before becoming a speech language pathologist with over 18 years of experience in the field. Mrs. Vivian Bullard has a Bachelor of Science degree in communication disorders. A trained clinician, she has more than 32 years of experience at the Ministry of Education in the field of speech language pathology. Finally, we have Mrs. Frozen Langdon Bethel. She was recruited from England by Mr. Rodney Bain, the Director of Education at the time in October of 1968 to establish the speech therapy services in the Bahamas working out of government and non-government organizations, such as the Center for Deaf Children. So this makes Ms. Langdon the first speech language pathologist in the speech therapy unit at Ministry of Education. Since retiring, Mrs. Langdon Bethel continues to give of her time and skills to provide services to government and non-government organizations, such as REACH, which stands for Resources and Education for Autism and Related Challenges. I, one of your moderators for today, my name is Kenria Brown. I also have a Bachelor of Science degree in speech language pathology and audiology and a Master of Science degree in speech language pathology. I was recently certified. Um, I got my certificate of clinical competence in 2019 and currently have been working with Ministry of Education for two years. So that is our entire group of panelists. For our presentations, we will start with Ms. Keva Ferguson. Following her will be Ms. Sharon Clark, and we will conclude with Dr. Deborah Newberth. Following that, we will have our question and answer section. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good. Can you hear me? All righty. Like she said, I'm Kevin Ferguson, and I'm a speech language pathologist. My job today is to share with you red flags and red, communication red flags in young children. Before we get to the red flags, we need to know what we're dealing with. And so briefly, I'll let you know what is speech and language. Speech and language is not the same. Speech 
is how we say words. And on the speech, we have um, articulation where we have words and sounds, and each sound, each letter in the alphabet has a sound, and sometimes they combine and give us two sounds, and we have some that come together and give us one sound. And we have to know how to pronounce those sounds. Then we have voice. Voice is the quality of our voice. And it's harsh or raspy. Um, harsh, raspy. Of course, our voice. And we have our pitch, whether it's high or low. Then we have fluency, which is the smooth flow of our words in when we talk. And that, that is what encompasses speech. Then we have what is known as language. And language refers to words we use and how we use them to share our ideas, to get our needs and wants. And under language, we have what we call semantics, where you have word meaning. So you could have a word like star. We talk about the star that's in the sky, and then you can talk about the star as an actor in a movie. So we have word and word meaning. We have grammar, where we use, um, we have children say sometimes, Himmy, my friend. So that's the usage of pronouns, where they're um, using an object pronoun, where they should be using a subject pronoun. Or uh, her is my friend. Or well, you, um, phonology also includes um, subject word, word agreement. Um, using complete sentences. Um, using complete sentences. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Syntax. Syntax is word order. So we would uh, we would say the red car and not the, the car red. And then pragmatics is our social language. Would we say um, politely? So we we'll just um, interrupt a conversation. We wait our turn to, to, to speak in the conversation. Or we'll say, um, grab something out of somebody's hand and say, give me my names. He said, may I have it, please? So this encompasses language. And then language is further divided into two groups. We have what is known as receptive language, what we understand, and we have expressive language, the way we say, the way we express ourselves using our words. And expressive language sometimes, and not sometimes, expressive language includes our nonverbal, our nonverbal communication. So we know by looks what someone may be saying. Okay, if we look at a child, when do you think communication starts? Somebody quickly tell me, when do you think communication starts? At what age? Come on, someone talk to me. You think it starts at one? Birth. Pardon me? Birth. Yes, it does start at birth. So when a child enters the world, his communication skills may not be as broad as ours. It's limited, but he communicates and he communicates effectively. Because a child at birth, when he hears a loud song like a dog barking on a fire engine, you see the child sh um, shimmer, indicating that he heard something. Or the child gives a smile when you talk to him. So he's looking at you and he knows that you're engaging in conversation with you. Or it's um, the child recognizes the voice of the mother. So when he's crying and the mother speaks, the child becomes calm and the crying ceases. And that is receptive. So the child is understanding and processing what is going on. Then expressively, a young child, a newborn baby, makes um, cooing sounds. You hear, um, they would change their cries. 
mother would know when the cries for food or when the cries for pain. And this is how the child is expressing his needs and wants without words, but he's understood. And sometimes the child just simply smiles at you. you know, the child says, no, he's happy. So from birth, the child is communicate, communicating. Now, if you don't see these things happening in your young know, child, now, this is a range. That range was birth to three months. And not because they reach hit four months and it is, and you don't see it, that means something is wrong. Sometimes there could be a slight delay. Sometimes there could be a slight challenge with probably something simple. But so what you do is you observe your child. Don't just think automatically something is wrong. So you, you check to see if your child can hear. You could stand behind your child and give a little tap where they don't see you. Or um, you could make noises, you, um, imitate what your child says, talk to your child like, he understands what you're saying and watches responses. Imitate his face, the faces he make. And at that early age, you could even start making the animal songs, um, playing little games with your child. And most importantly, read to your child. Read, read, read to your child. Okay. Um, so that's from birth to three months. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do certain ages to let, to let you see what is typical. Now, that's typical for birth to three months. And like I said, not because the child hits four months and you don't see those things. I mean, something is wrong. Around, let's say, when it's time for the child to enter school, certain skills. Now, these are not all the skills. I'm just hitting and moving. Receptively, a child, when he um, grade, um, around the age of six, five to six, and that's in the grade one stage, he can recall the information. He can remember what you say to him. The child can, you could tell the child to go in your room, get the brush and bring it to me. The child should be able to do that at age six. And that's what we call receptive. And with the receptive language, a child understands more than he can say. You'll see that in even adults. That's the more dominant language, part of language, the receptive language. At this age also, when for the expressive part, child should be speaking clearly um, at this age, at this stage in his life. Family members and strangers can understand what is being said. said. He can tell a story and retell a story and do it in sequence. Um, he can stay on topic with a conversation. He can ask, ask and answer those WH questions. What, why, where, when. He can answer those. He can tell you how to make cereal, simple things. He can tell you how to polish your shoes. A child at this stage can do that. And remember, it's a range. And a child can start and engage in conversation with you. And it's a range that these things, so not when the child, if this is happening, this is said to be developmental stage for five, six year old, not when the child is seven, oh, someone, no, watch it. You observe. Uh, so let's look at another child, a child around in grade six, nine to 10, what are some things should be happening with this child? He's listening and he's drawing conclusions. He can infer what's, what you're saying. Um, that's receptively. Expressively, he can make a presentation. He can tell you something in sequence. He can uh, report information about an event that he witnessed. He can Plan, sit down and plan a speech and, and give that speech. That's at age 10, at age 10, 9, 10, within that range. Now that we know some of the typical behaviors for those ages, what would we look for to say is atypical? First of all, how can you help this child? Sorry, how can you help this child? You talk about what you're doing while you're doing. And as you do that, you're giving the child vocabulary. So let's take, for instance, you're baking a cake. The child names all the ingredients. And you could do that at any stage. You could do that. The, your, your preschoolers, early, um, lower primary or upper primary. And if the child has a delay, you could definitely do an activity like this. Get all the ingredients. Name those ingredients. As he pours, he talk about what he's doing. Pour the flour. Stir. So the action matches the word. And 
build the vocabulary like that. Playing simple games, these games that we take for granted. Concentration category, you're working on basic concepts. In there, you're working on categories. So we names of all colors. So they can name colors. They can name things we eat. You can make different colors. I went the game I went to market. So you're working on recall because you have the person goes on and you have to remember from A to B and your number, your G. So you have to remember what was said from A to G and to G. And that's the beauty in those games. And we don't realize this. So your child is having fun and also learning. So that's the importance of those games. I remember playing them as a child. Maridal, Maridal, Mirandi, or I Spy. You're working on an adjective description. So they can clearly um, describe an item. And so as you play these games, you're building your child's language skills. Again, you also want to read. Read constantly to your children. And you as a parent, talk less. Allow the child to speak more and express themselves. Because you as a parent, one likely you know how to express yourself now. And of course, you know how to express yourself much better than your child. So allow your child to learn that skill and let him do it freely. Don't interrupt. And when he's done, you can model the correct saying was or is. <clears throat> okay, I want you to sit listen carefully to this. Um, Sounds. I hope you can hear it. Nothing yet. No, no, ma'am. Okay, we won't waste time. But um, that basically is telling us about the speech sounds. They are early um, at the first set of speech sounds that we get are the we call bilabial ones. They're eight. They come in stages of eight. So you'll have the early speech sounds would be the sounds such as buh. Huh. Um, mm, these are early sounds, and the children by three years old would have these. Again, it's a range. Don't get alarmed because the child reaches three and you don't hear these sounds in their vocabulary. No, give them time. You observe them. That's the early sounds. And then we have the middle sounds. So the next eight songs that the child learns by the age five that he should have are uh, the t ink, g, sh, and j. And again, it's a, the, the stages of development and it's a range. So we have the first eight, now we have the middle eight and the last eight songs that a child learns. Uh, these are the late songs. So, if you have a child, oh, go ahead, let's go. So you have here the last eight songs. The sh, s, s, l, and sh, sh, okay? Those are the developmental songs and the manner in which they get them. We, um, as they develop, you get them and it's in that, it's in a range once again. If if the child doesn't have those songs, you um, those songs come in range. And here are some atypical atypical speech behaviors that at the age of five, a child should still not be deleting songs and words. So you shouldn't hear a child saying "ansel" or "pencil." particularly because that puss sound is one of the early speech sounds and the ones they should have around the age of three. You should hear wawa and nana. That's a part of development, but you should hear water, banana. 
Um, sometimes you um, hear tat for cat at age five. That is fading away. You shouldn't hear those sounds. So that is when you see this happening in a five-year-old. That, that is sort of atypical. Then, as we look at um, a child that is breaking up his words. Initial song, he says it several times before he gets the word out. So you will hear mom, mom, mommy. Or you'll hear the child holding a song too long. So instead of saying son, you hear son. Or you will hear a child out open, pushing for the word to come out, but you hear nothing. That's not typical. Could everybody tell me what kind of speech, what kind of speech that is? What would we call that? Somebody talk to me. What part of articulation or um, articulation or speech would that be? Anybody heard about stuttering? A few people said it in the chat. Oh, okay. So yes, that'll be stuttering. Um, then you also have sometimes where you have person, a person's birth voice is harsh or their pitch is too high for their age or gender. Anybody knows what we're talking about there? What part of speech that is? Here, um, sometimes you hear a voice that's goggly, like it's wet. Anybody knows that that's voice difficulty? If you hear that kind of speech in your child, what I just described, that's a red flag. What's going on? You observe. And so how can you help your child if something like that is going on? For speech challenges, you want to get at your child's level. When you get at your child's level, you want to get face to face. So as you talk, your child can see what you're doing with your mouth and imitate. So that's why you want to get face to face. You want to read daily to your child. When you read to your child, you want to position your child, not side to side, but face to face. You turn the book upside, right, upside down to you and right side up for the child and you share the book. So as the child reads, looks down and reads, he could look up at you and see what you're doing with your mouth. You want to um, when it comes to stuttering, you want to stay calm. So your child can stay calm. You don't want to pressure, you don't want to tell your child, start, um, slow down, start over, take your time. We call that good, bad advice. You don't want to put that kind of pressure on your child. So you, you may make it even more frustrating for the child to bring out his words. For those of us with a voice challenge, we want to keep our vocal folds hydrated. You know, preachers and teachers who use you know, persons who use their voices constantly, they need um, to keep it hydrated. You'll find that they they are the ones who receive that challenge with, with um, voice difficulties most times, not all the time, most times. So you want to keep them hydrated. You want to do less screaming. And of course, you want to have some vocal rest. So you have a time where you just relax and don't say anything. Those are some things you can do when you, um, based on what's going on with the child, you can, you, you as a parent can help. But most of all, what you want to do, you want to observe your child to make sure it's a challenge because it may just be something pleading. So you observe the child. And then if you're concerned, you want to talk to um, maybe the child's pediatrician. You don't want to diagnose your child. Please don't diagnose a child and you don't want to stay in that stage of denial too long because while you're in that stage of denial, the, the problem is growing and you, we want what we call early intervention because early intervention is key. And most of all, you want to seek professional help. Okay? And I got my information from asha.org and asha is a... Uh, it's a governing body for speech language pathologists in the States and also internationally, we are part of that. Uh, yeah, it's been my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you, Ms. Ferguson. So we will now have Ms. Sharon Clark. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, Ms. Brown, can you put up my um, PowerPoint, please? Okay. Can everyone hear me? I, I truly hope so. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And it is certainly a pleasure to be here along with my colleagues, um, both the speech language pathologists or speech therapists, as we commonly call ourselves, as well as Dr. Newberg, um, who is the audiologist or the hearing specialist, one of a few that we have here in the country. And we are all presenting together because of the importance and because of um, the alignment or the way that speech and hearing develops for a child or for anybody to be able to talk, to be able to communicate. The most important thing, which Dr. Benneby, Dr. Benneby Newbert, sorry, will, I am using a maiden name, pardon me, will share with um, her married name, sorry, will share with you um, will be the importance of persons being able to hear properly if they're going to speak, if they're going to use language. And so I um, would just like to say before I begin, on behalf of the Ministry of Education, the Department of Education, our director, Mr. Marcellus Taylor, um, our immediate supervisor, Ms. Sharon Poitier, I'd like to say thank you for having us, um, for acknowledging the role or the roles that we play as educators in our country as well. And certainly the relationship and the collaborations that we like to foster such as this one with our NGOs and with our private um, educational systems and that being the um, Seventh-day Adventist school systems. And we know Kenry is an integral part of your system. She came through it and she continues to give back um, as she's giving back to us here, us here at the speech therapy unit at the Ministry of Education. And so my um, topic will just carry on hopefully from what my colleague, Ms. Ferguson shared with us and that being communication. That's what we're all about, communication or more, um, commonly known as speech and language problems. And um, I'm going just to share a tidbit with you of what we look for, what you see when you talk about communication, red flags in adults. Okay, Ms. Um, Brown, next slide, please. Okay, are you able to um, enlarge in that screen for me? Yes, my glasses giving me a run for my money. And are you able to get that any larger? I would have to come out on the presentation. Oh, yeah. It's, it's kind of small. Um, if you came out of then what I would have to, that's the largest, you can get it. Okay, um, let me see something. Oh, wow. One second, please, pardon me. Um, that's the largest that you can get it. Without increasing the font, yes. If you increase the font, because I really can't um, read it, to tell you the truth. Um, okay, what I'll have to do is just speak um, from my prior knowledge because I'm unable to read it. Okay. Um, okay, time, time. Um, I pinched it and it, becomes huge. Okay, time is of the essence. Okay, so basically what I um, will share with you 
um, or, or you know, had planned to share with you is to talk about what do we see when we um, see speech and language or we see communication difficulties in adults. And we know that adults may be either born with um, speech and language difficulties. So it starts from childhood, but we more focus on those that are what we call acquired. Okay, acquired meaning just as it says that somehow they quote unquote for born of a better term, got this speech and language or this communication difficulties. And um, they, they may acquire um, these difficulties anywhere in their development from childhood to a young adult to a more matured adult. Um, they may, you know, acquire these problems because of any of a, maybe a medical illness, because of a road traffic accident, maybe um, importantly, because of a hearing loss, um, because of other cognitive or other um, conditions like mental retardation, like autism spectrum disorders, like cerebral palsy, and like Mrs. Ferguson said earlier, stuttering, or as we might say in the Bahamas, stammering, as well as some even acquired voice disorders, okay? Um, and these things, like I said, um, usually result after the person has acquired or after the person has learned to talk and after the person has learned the rules for speaking, the rules of engagement, so to speak, the rules um, for using language, the rules for using um, phonology, um, the social graces, as we call them, or the social use of language. Ms. Ferguson referred to earlier as the pragmatics, so that you know, um, you wait until a person is finished speaking before you um, begin speaking, or you don't cut a person off midway in their sense, you know, if they are expressing themselves, that kind of thing. And then the other big one we have in adults, which we consider to be a part of our bag of um, communication disorders, would be those. Um, difficulties that adults usually have, um, that they would usually have as a result of stuttering maybe or a head injury, and that being those swallowing disorders. And um, I'd like us to just stick a pin here because it's very important. Those things are important or it is important because we know swallowing is, by the, is the means by which we get nutrition. So essentially the, the means by um, which we live, right? And so, um, that's a, that's a big one for us because then if a person, let's say, has a stroke and is unable to swallow, they're unable to get their nutrition, then you can have all sorts of other things going on. It affects them emotionally. It could affect them mentally. Um, the other, um, Ms. Um, Brown, oh, I see you're trying to, you're still trying to highlight it and I'm, I'm just going on. Okay. Um, the other, the other thing that I um, wanted to pay um, some more attention to would be those um, difficulties that persons have um, when, like I said earlier, when they have head injury, and it could be um, what we call traumatic head injury, where, you know, they've been in a car accident and their head bounces against the ceiling or against the steering wheel, or you could have a close head injury whereby um, the person gets a blow to the head, but you see no signs of it. I remember as an example, very vividly, I saw a young man, I see him walking around today, you know, praise the Lord, he did well, and he is back doing, you know, living his life normally, but he was beaten severely in a club um, and he was beaten in his head and there was no, no, no overt injury. So there was no bruising, there was no cuts, there, were, there was nothing to indicate that he had gotten, but it's just that, you know, the witnesses and he, of course, went into um, a coma for several weeks and all of that, but there was nothing on the outside to indicate that he had been beaten as, as badly as he had been beaten. And after he came out of the coma, 
um, you would have been shocked to see that here was this person, well, you know, he manifested problems um, behaviorally, you know, he couldn't control his thoughts, he couldn't control his emotions, but also um, in terms of his speech, it was very um, confused, he used jargon, he just was like we would say was talking foolishness for weeks, um, he couldn't understand himself and we couldn't understand him, we being the nursing staff, the medical staff, myself as the speech therapist, and that, um, I think that would have been the worst case that I had seen of a closed head, um, traumatic head injury that somebody um, would have had. And um, so you can have those types of communication problems. And what results when you have head injury, a lot of times would be the memory difficulties that persons have. They would either have, either have difficulties with short-term memory or long-term memory um, challenges whereby um, it can be either or they would know what it is they want to say, but in a lot of cases when it's head injury, they, because of all the confusion and all the other things going on with them, they wouldn't even know what it is they want to say, so they wouldn't respond appropriately to stimuli or to questions or to conversation or queries or anything like that. Um, but rather they would just um, use jargon and th those types of persons are unable to help themselves um, because you know, if you have, let's say a word finding problem, which is another type of um, recall problem that adults would have, particularly when you have a stroke, right? Um, you would know what you wanna say, you the individual, the adult, um, but you just can't get it out. Um, you know, you, you, and you're unable to use those um, strategies that we normally use as, a, as human beings to help us recall things through visual imagery, through visualization, through association, that kind of thing. But they, um, they would be unable, you know, to get the words out. And um, I've been referring to strokes and head in um, strokes, of course, but I wanna come back to that because it's so prevalent and it is um, so important. Um, persons having a stroke manifest what we call aphasias, right? And aphasia um, is just, it's the loss of words, the loss, the loss of the ability to use words, um, simply put, right? And that, um, and aphasia can result from, I keep coming back to strokes just because it's so familiar and that's what a lot of us or the majority of us would be familiar with. Um, when you have a stroke, um, you, you sometimes, not all the time, sometimes you would have, you know, you would have aphasia, you would, you would lose your words completely, whereby you become almost, or you become nonverbal and you're unable to talk at all. Or you can use your lose sorry lose your words partially, where maybe you'd be able to just use words and speak like what we call telegraphically, like you are labeling, where you just use in one word and really it doesn't it has meaning maybe for you, but it doesn't have meaning to the listener. And it's difficult to sort of you know figure out what it is, what is it that um, you're trying to say. Persons with um, a stroke and thereby an aphasia would also have difficulties, I said, um, with memory as well. They would have memory challenges, but they would also have cognitive deficits. And a big one would be, like Ms. Ferguson said about young children, would be the receptive area or the nonverbal right area of language whereby they have difficulty with comprehending with understanding what they hear what they see as well as processing so you know it could be a, a situation where you if i say to you open the door as simple as that open the door or open the black door the person with the aphasia um, would understand the word door, but might not remember or understand open and would not know what I mean to do, what I want him or her to do with it. And so I've seen adults, you know, go to the door and try to lick the door, right? Or try to hoist, them, hoist themselves up on, say, the lock on the door. Um, and it could be as severe as that, you know, um, where their skills become deficient. And Right along um, along that vein, um, 
we also have the other side of it, which would be the expressive side of it, where the person, like I said, is unable to speak or they manifest difficulty with their word order. So they, again, they use gibberish or their sentences are all back to front. Um, the structure or the order of the sentence is impaired. And then another area, and these would be the three main areas that um, you see difficulties in adults who have strokes or head injuries would be what we call an, an apraxia. Okay, an apraxia or dyspraxia or verbal apraxia. And that is when that area of the brain that's responsible for the motor movements of speech are impaired or become affected because of the stroke. And so the individual, while they might, they, they never lose their ability to use words. And when I say use words, I'm talking about the language use of words, so their vocabulary, right? But what happens is they have a difficulty with the motor use of words. So they would manifest, quote unquote, articulation or pronunciation or production difficulties. Um, and these persons, no matter how you, you know, generally will say, well, say it like this or say cat, say cat. I'm saying cat and the person might say, Ta, or the person might say kata or something completely off from what it is that you've said um, or you've given them to say. And it's because the muscles and the motor area of the brain responsible for speaking does not function or is not functional or has become affected by the difficulty. And then the third more common area um, with adults that we see would be that area called, or that, sorry, that disorder called, those disorders, um, dis dysarthria. And dysarthria simply meaning difficulty, again, with the production of speech. So whereby the muscles, the muscles responsible for speaking have been impacted by the stroke. And so the muscles, so if the muscles are not working and moving, then of course your speech is not gonna come out the way that it should. And so what you would see is you would get a lot of unintelligibility ranging from where a person might just substitute sounds um, for in their words, when they're trying to produce words, um, to the extent where the person leaves or, or off um, sounds in words, or the person's speech is so distorted, sometimes we've heard that the person sounds like they have a hot potato in their mouth, okay, so they talk as if they're, um, as if, you know, they're trying to eat a hot potato at the same time, and you could just, just imagine how that would be, and with your speech, would sound like. And um, those persons, for me, and I think for most speech language pathologists or speech ther therapists would say, whenever you have a person who has a stroke and you get a, a diagnosis of a dysarthria, um, that person is um, less impacted, I would venture to say, because then it doesn't involve anything cognitive, perhaps, or intellectual, like you would have if you have an aphasia. Um, and so <clears throat> for persons um, who have dysarthria, they're gonna be the persons who it's difficult to understand them, or you see some other signs, like maybe they might be drooling, or you see some additional difficulties with eating because the same muscles that are used for speaking, some of the same muscles would be used in eating and in swallowing. So you will see concomitant difficulties with speaking, with producing words, with um, combining words to use sentences fluently and clearly, but they would also have difficulty with swallowing or with moving the articulators and that the articulators being the tongue, the lips, the teeth, the cheeks, the jaws, those types of things that we use um, when we talk. Um, and I think I have I think I would have pretty much covered most of them, but in the adult population and more prevalent. So in the adult population, the other main 
communication difficulty that we see would be that of voice. Now, I like to say here in the Bahamas, we see a lot of um, pseudo voice difficulties or we see um, voice difficulties as a result of occupation. So we could call them quote unquote, occupational hazards. Anybody want to venture or take a guess as to what I might be talking about, not the speech therapist, but anybody else, um, somebody manifesting a voice problem because of your job? Anyone put it in the chat, Ms. Brown, anybody? No, okay, in the interest of time, let me just, um, okay, very good. Very good, Ms. Latoya Smith Burrows. Jackie and Jack, oh, Sano said maybe um, construction workers. Jackie said singers, excellent, excellent. And you know, you all are gonna figure out my age now when I give you this example. Um, I, you know, I'd always heard and I'd read it somewhere that Celine Dion, for example, and a number of other superstars and those who sing particularly, who could think of what they do, all the musicians in the audience, what do they do before they have a big performance? And by the way, I've heard some Bahamian, I, Bahamian performers, I think, I might have heard KB say this in an interview or somebody else, a Bahamian entertainer said this as well. This is what they do before they perform. Well, of course, yeah, they have to practice, but let's, let's think about um, vocal preservation and the quality when you perform. Vocal exercises, warm up, right? Um, but something that's a late drink tea, nah. Well, it depends on what kind of tea by um, Viola Stewart. Um, we don't recommend drinking caffeine, okay? Particularly, and I'm sure singers would tell you that because just how caffeine isn't so good for the body, it wouldn't be good for singers and even for, for teachers and preachers, I would venture to say. Cargle with warm water, yeah, that's something that you do prior to when you're doing your ranges and your warming up. Very good, Viola Stewart, that's, that's what I wanted to see or to hear. You don't speak a lot before you sing. In fact, Celine Dion says, I think for maybe even 24 hours or maybe more, she doesn't talk at all or very minimally. Um, she uses a lot of nonverbal language and communication and that is she writes or now I guess she uses a computer, she uses a phone, I would, I would venture to say. And that's because the um, vocal cords that we use, that we all use to speak with, they're delicate. That's a delicate, they're delicate. And so they're prone to, to abuse and they're prone to the same kind of things that you might see when we um, have, when you look at the outer body, when you look at the um, the arms, the legs, that kind of thing, okay? And so persons who sing, well, let me first get back to the occupational hazard. And if they came in the chat, so that would be teachers, that would be singers, that would be um, presenters, people who present a lot. Um, and the big one would be preachers. Thank you, Emily, pastors, right? Because you know, if you're delivering a 45 to 60 minute sermon and you're delivering that at the wrong, at the incorrect pitch, the incorrect tone for your size, for your gender, for your age, preachers in the audience here, I'm sure could tell you what happens. You, you, would, you would think that you run, but you run about two to three miles when you're finished. And I said it because I know us as speech therapists and the teachers in the audience could tell you that after they've finished a day of constant talking, their outer body, their physical body is extremely tired. Okay, so just imagine those two little vocal cords down in there. And so we see a lot of persons with, um, or used to see, Ms. Langdon is our expert, expert and another therapist who is in private practice, Paula Bulleg. They see a lot of um, teachers and persons who talk a lot. I remember, I remember that I had a lady who worked when it was called BTC. I had a lady, she was a telephone operator. The young people in the audience mightn't remember or know what that is. But when BTC had telephone operators, so that meant she 
constantly answered um, the telephone and she constantly fielded questions for the corporation. And she came to me because then um, she had growths on her vocal folds or what we call nodules. Okay, and these things, I guess if you think about it, how a corn grows on your toe when you wear the wrong size shoe, right? Um, on ill-fitting shoe, and you you know that that's rubbing constantly against particularly your small toe, your little toe on the top of your, um, yes, on the top of your toes. Um, then um, imagine that that's similarly what goes on with the vocal folds. And so I've been given my cue. I hope I've given you some food for thought. These are just some of the nuggets of some of the things you see when adults have um, communication dis difficulties, whether um, it's because of being born with them or whether it's acquired because of one illness or one injury or the other. And so I thank you very much and I'd be very happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Clark. Um, those in the audience, participants, please remember that you are free to type all of your questions in the chat and we will get to as many of them as possible at the end of the final presentation, which will be Dr. Deborah Newberth. Good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Newberth. And on behalf of the other audiologists here in the Bahamas, Dr. Kim Scriven and Dr. Treasure Kenny, I'm here to represent hearing red flags, red flags that may be possible in the various age groups. And I have them split into four categories, newborn to toddlers, preschoolers to preteens, tweens and teens, and adults. So let's begin with the first, which are the babies. One of the first signs, red flags, is does your child startle to loud sounds? For example, if somebody slams the door or if there's a big boom, does your child jump and startle? That's even from like a newborn. Does the child fail to turn when you come into the room? So when you enter the room, does the child turn the head when they're able to, which would be like around six months of age, your child should be able to begin turning toward the sounds. Does your child say basic words like mama, dada? Does the child look toward you when you call him, when you speak to her? Is she turning toward you? Or is the child, if you are turned away from the child, is she not responding? Is he not responding? Does he seem to hear some things but not other things. For example, is he hearing more loud sounds, but seems to be missing the softer sounds? These are some of the basic things that you need to look for when you're looking for red flags in babies. Moving on now to the toddlers up to the school age kids. What about your child's speech? At age two, three, your child should be saying at least phrases, even sentences. So if you look at other kids their age and they're not speaking on par with those other children, that's a red flag you need to be aware of. Does your child have any speech and language at all? Maybe the child doesn't even have any speech or language. Maybe they're still not even saying mama and dada. These are things that you need to be looking out for. What about unclear speech? The child is able to speak, but the speech is not very clear. If this is the case, then it means that this is a red flag for hearing. And a lot of people say, well, what does speech have to do with hearing? Well, the child will only be able to speak as well as he can hear. So if he's not hearing well, then he's not gonna be speaking well. If he's not hearing at all, then he probably won't be speaking at all. Can your child follow basic instructions, just even simple ones like go get the ball, turn the light off, get your shoe? Can they follow those instructions? Can your child follow multiple instructions? Go in the fridge, get the milk, pour some in the cup and bring it here. Can your child do those things? Does your child say, huh? or what, or I didn't hear you, 
Do they say that a lot? If they're saying those things, that's another red flag. What about if they're watching TV or playing their video games? Do they like to turn it up loud? If they're turning it up loudly, then that's another red flag. Maybe the child has to turn it up to a level that he is able to hear it because he's not hearing the softer sounds. What about the milestones? When you compare, again, when you compare your child to children his age, now we're dealing with the ages, remember from preschoolers to uh, primary school. Is your child on the same level as other children with his language skills, with his speech skills, with his academic skills? A lot of times when you have children in this age group and they're having problems with their hearing, even their academics, especially like the language classes, English, spelling, vocabulary, you may find that they are very delayed in those things compared to other children. What about their social skills? A lot of times when children are having a problem with their hearing, they don't wanna be playing with other children. They don't wanna mix with too many kids because they feel they're not hearing well enough. And so they just isolate themselves. What about when your child is wearing the earbuds and headphones? Earbuds is one of the biggest problems we're having right now with children developing hearing loss. So is your child wearing earbuds frequently? And are they turning it up loud? If you're sitting right next to your child and they're wearing earbuds and you can hear the sound coming through, then that means it's too loud and it can be a problem with their hearing. Let's move on now to the tweens and the teens. So these are the older children. And sometimes when a child is growing up, initially they may be fine, but as they get older, they can develop problems with their hearing. So you need to be checking at each stage of development. So is your child complaining about hearing buzzing and humming noises or ringing noises in their ears? That's one of the most common signs of hearing loss. Does your child speak loudly? Again, do, you, do they like to turn the TV up or the video up? Do they too like to wear earbuds and wear them where if you're sitting next to them, you can hear the noise coming through? What are their grades like? Are their grades poor? If they have poor grades, hearing loss should be one of the first things you're checking because it may not be that your child cannot do the work it just may mean that he's not hearing well enough to get the work done correctly. One of the things, another red flag is, does your child have any anger management issues? When a child has a hearing loss, they become very frustrated. And this results in them having issues with anger, frustration. They try to take it out on themselves or other people. And in school, they have behavior problems. They are the ones always going to the office or the teacher is always speaking to them. And some of the same things that apply to the younger children will also apply to these children, okay? Do they turn when you are calling them? Do you think, oh, this child is just hard-headed, they're not listening? Is it really that the child is not listening or is it that the child is not hearing? Does your child isolate from you? Do they just go in their room because they don't want to be bothered with anybody? Do they not have a lot of friends? Sometimes, again, this is another sign. Do they ignore conversation? And even at this age, is the child having a problem with their speech and their language skills? Finally, we're going to move on to red flags in adults. Some of the same things that apply to children apply to adults, except these are some other things you can look for. Does the adult have any problems hearing on the telephone? Or does he hear on one side, but not the other side? Because sometimes it might just be a hearing loss in one ear. And this again can apply to other, um, the younger children as well. Does the adult have a problem following conversational speech? And sometimes as adults get older, we begin to think, well, they just having problems with their memory or they're having Alzheimer's or dementia. When in reality, sometimes it's just that they're having a problem with their hearing. And if they can get a hearing test and, and properly have their hearing managed, 
those signs and symptoms that you see with following a conversation tend to go away. Even their memory tends to improve. What about turning the TV up loud? Are other family members in the house and even the neighbors saying that the TV is too loud, that they could hear it blaring from outside even? If that's the case, then hearing is one of the more common things that you should be checking. Does the adult say, huh, what? I didn't hear you. Or do they say, everybody just mumbles. Nobody is speaking clearly. All of these are possible signs of hearing loss. What about your adult saying things sound muffled or that the air seems plugged, like something is clogging it? This is a sign that there's possibly something going on with the hearing. What about they waking up and suddenly they say, you know, I was fine, but it's feeling like I'm not hearing. Sometimes that happens. You're fine when you go to bed and when you wake up, you're not hearing. Or during the day, all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I'm not hearing. What's going on? Is the adult having any ringing in their ears? Buzzing noises, tinnitus or tinnitus, like some people say. A lot of times we see this particularly around people who work in noisy environments, musicians, construction workers, people who work in lawnmower, with lawn care um, machinery, anybody who works around any kind of loud noises. If they're having any ringing, buzzing noises in their ear, they should be having their hearing checked. Actually, they should be having their hearing checked once a year anyway, because they're working around loud noises. Now, those are the red flags. And then I'm just gonna briefly touch on some of the things that may cause a hearing loss. So not every hearing loss is a permanent hearing loss. Some of them can be easily corrected. One of the most common forms of hearing loss is impacted wax, when you have too much wax in your ear and you gotta get it out or even a foreign object, maybe something crawled into your ear or you stuck a Q-tip into your ear, which you shouldn't be doing because the air cleans itself. So you don't have to be putting anything in your ear at all. You just use a towel and wipe your ear. But people put Q-tips and hairpins and all kinds of stuff in their ear that could cause damage to the auditory system. Um, air infections, another um, very, very common form of hearing loss otosclerosis, okay? And then sometimes we see women after they have had children, they tend to lose their hearing, their hearing decreases. Certain kinds of tumors can cause hearing loss. One of the um, common forms of hearing loss as we're getting older is called presbycusis. It's an age-related hearing loss, just like how we tend to get lose our vision, our vision gets dimmer. So same thing happens to the hearing. So once you get like around the age of 50, you should, if you've never had a hearing test, then you should be coming to have a hearing test just to see, am I beginning to have signs of hearing loss? Noise damage is actually the leading cause of hearing loss. I can't emphasize that enough because we're having so many younger people now coming in with hearing loss because they're wearing the earbuds, they're listening to the noise so loud, the music so loud. Um, acoustic neurumas, drug, certain medications that you may take, especially like for cancer treatment and things like that can result in a hearing loss. But in a lot of cases, that's the medication that you just have to take. Multiple sclerosis, head injuries. Did you fall? Did you bang your head? Did you have any trauma to the head? So those are my red flags. And those are the basic things that may cause a hearing loss. And that's where I'm going to end it. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you to the Seventh-day Adventist Youth for inviting me and on behalf of Dr. Scriven and Dr. Kenny. Thank you again, Dr. Newberth, for that presentation. So now that we've come to the end of our presentations, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add all of the panelists to the screen so that you can see them. And I got a few questions during, during each topic, each presentation. So any one of you is free to answer the question related to that topic. 
If you can turn your cameras on, panelists, that would be very helpful. Okay. So my first question is actually directed to something Ms. Ferguson said in her presentation. So the person said that Ms. Ferguson said that not meeting the communication slash language milestones at the stated age is cause for concern at the onset, but just continue to observe. So at what point or how long should we observe before it becomes a concern that a problem may exist. Thanks for your question. It's not the onset we're looking at. Like I said, it's a range. And if you observe over a period of time, let's say several weeks, a month or so, then you start to inquire. And you've tried some things, um, start to inquire, maybe the pediatrician, depending on what's going on. But definitely if it's a speech and language, you want to find a speech language pathologist to ascertain what's going on with the child. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Another question. Do you think prolonged use of a pacifier and they say, not sure if this is considered to be prolonged, but say up to the age of three years old, can contribute to a delay in speech and or language development. Okay, let me take a shot at that one. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it would contribute to the a delay in language development, but certainly <clears throat> depend, <clears throat> sorry, pardon me, I seem to have a frog in my throat. Um, certainly it can, and we've seen where it does affect the alignment of the jaws. Okay, so the upper and the lower jaws become a um, misaligned because of, of the constant sucking and that sucking is not normal. Particularly, you said after three years, yeah, that's definitely too long for um, a child to be sucking. So it would affect the alignment of the jaws or it could affect it. And then therefore the speech, speech development is going to be impacted because you know, um, once the air comes up from the lungs, from the diaphragm, from the lungs, through the vocal folds and into our mouths, then um, the structures within the mouth shapes that air, right? And that is how we get a T versus a D versus a P versus an M, right? Or M, okay? And so if you have something that shouldn't be there, pushing one way or the other, and usually the pacifier, is pressing down on the lips, right? On the bottom lips or maybe on both lips, as well as the, 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 the front part or the anterior part of the pacifier could be pushing up on the upper jaw. So the upper front teeth could also be affected. Just like you see when children or adults suck their finger, a lot of time um, you see where they have what we call like a spacing and um, an irregular spacing or a hole almost, if they try to put their teeth together like we, like they, you know, like we should, they're unable to bring them together. So their first stop would be to the dentist or the orthodontist, depending on the age. If they're less than seven years old, I think it is seven to eight years old, then they, you know, they go to their pediatric or to a dentist. Um, and if they're older than, eight, say, eight years old, definitely they need to see the orthodontist. And after that, usually they, um, if by applying braces or applying retainers or other things can't assist, then they would send them to speech therapy to correct um, what has gone wrong with the speech sound productions. And we have to reteach them how to make speech sounds. So, but not so much the language, language, because remember language is cognitively based and it's in, you know, it has to do with um, the intellect. So it shouldn't, <clears throat> sorry, it shouldn't affect 
um, the language more so the oral motor and the speech production. <clears throat> Thank you. So it looks like one of my questions was answered in the chat, but I will ask it just in case. It says there are a mixture of yes and no question answers to the questions Dr. Newbirth mentioned when you gave your list of red flags. It says, is there a standardized questionnaire a parent can complete for a child to determine if a hearing problem may exist? Yes, there is um, standardized questionnaires. Um, you can either go to the ASHA, A-S-H-A, capital letters for each, which is the American Speech and Language Hearing Association. And they have a list of the red flags that you can be looking for based on the age of the child. However, that being said, a hearing test is the only way to determine whether or not the child has a hearing loss. And we begin testing babies from the time they are born, they can have a hearing test. Thank you. So I have a question related to dementia. How effective is speech therapy in treating persons with dementia? Okay, I guess the, it, there's variability, but if as you know, as we can appreciate, when you um with the <clears throat> I'm sorry, with with the dementias, um, you know, what is being affected is definitely the cognitive area of the brain, right? The auditory um, area of the brain, the auditory processing area of the brain. And a lot of those um, things that come with dementia or dementia itself, we know it's progressive and it could be degenerative, meaning that over time it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better, unfortunately. And so, yes, you can look at um, prognosis or how well the person will, would do with speech therapy. Speech therapies aim with the dementias and, difficult, and persons who have those sorts of problems is to try to get them to maintain to maintain the skills that they have as opposed to teaching them new skills. Yes, you teach them new ways of doing things, new, new ways of remembering where their shoe was, new ways and giving them new strategies and simpler strategies for remembering that this is my husband and not my daughter, that kind of thing. So very simplistic, but very functional sorts of things. And so, yes, I would, agree with where I think you're going, which is as, as the dementia gets worse, as the, the condition worsens, your um, prognosis is also gonna worsen, unfortunately. Thank you. Another question. Oh, I believe this has been answered in the chat. How can you tell the difference between whether an adult has a hearing problem if you find yourself repeating what you've said to them, or if it's just a matter of them tuning you out or not paying attention to the current conversation. And I guess that's also a question for children, not just adults. Yes, um, again, sometimes if the person is speaking loudly or if they're not answering you correctly, they may not have a problem with the hearing, but the only way to determine that is for them to have a hearing test. So a hearing test under headphones is gonna be the only sure way. Sometimes um, when we're having just a basic screening and you may go to your general practitioner or one of the other doctors and they would do a tuning fork test. However, a tuning fork test is not giving you frequency specific information across the entire speech range and it's not giving you each particular air. So the only way to get the um, more accurate information is to get a hearing test under headphones. And for the infants, there's a, we, we do the test in another way, um, but it's mm -hmm. similar. It would still be identifying each particular air. Okay, so speaking of infants, Thank you, Dr. Newberth. Another question that was asked was, can even a mute baby communicate from birth? 
going back to, I guess, what Ms. Ferguson discussed um, about the different stages. So the question is, can even a mute baby communicate from birth? Yes, um, communication is not just simply talking. You have um, the indirect, like how I mentioned, the cries. The cries are different, so the mother knows just what's going on. Um, responses through smiles or you know, the happy look moving their arms and legs, they're communicating. And based on what's going on, um, environment, the parent can tell what the baby is, is saying. And so that's how we know what they're saying. And then understanding comes before speaking. So the baby by crying and realizing that an adult comes to attend to it is learning um, to communicate, although he's not saying words yet, um, just by the action of the adult that his cry is caused is the beginning of communication. Okay, thank you. I think we've gotten through almost all of the questions. Let's see, which ones are left? Okay. Can a child learn speech even if they're deaf? Absolutely. A child can learn speech even if they are deaf. It means that there's gonna be a lot of work that has to be put into it. If yes. they are using hearing aids, they're gonna need a lot of speech therapy, auditory training, oral rehabilitation. Yes. Um, if they have what we call a cochlear implant, that would make it easier for them to acquire speech. However, they still would need speech therapy, auditory training, and oral rehabilitation. So it's a lot of work, but mm -hmm. it's not impossible. Actually, it's very, very possible. Yes. And can I just add, Dr. Newberg, the family dynamic, you want to speak to that portion of it with children who are deaf? The family plays a critical role in how well the child is going to develop speech and language yes. because it starts from as soon as you realize that the child has a problem with their hearing. So sometimes it's found out as soon as the child is born. And sometimes it happens later in life, but it doesn't matter what stage. The family has to realize that the child cannot do it on their own. It's a family thing. It's a school thing. The whole community has to play a part in the child learning yes. and developing normal speech and language. So it's a lot of work, um, particularly when you're dealing with children who are very, very deaf, you know, um, a lot of times the family, parents, they just don't have the time or the energy to invest into the development of their child's speech and language. And two, they become frustrated when the child is not speaking, but everybody has to play a part if the child is to be successful. And I don't know if Ms. Clark has anything more to add to that. Um. No, Dr. Newbert, I think you, you, I wanted you to make that point right there, that it's a, it's a team effort. It, it's not just the speech therapist and the child, um, but it's the school, it's the family, it's, it's the, it's the village, you mm -hmm. know. And I think this applies to, I mean, even mild speech and language problems, the family plays an important role. Yes. Yes, Ms. Langdon. <clears throat> Yeah, you can actually tell of the families and the parents and, you know, community um, that gets together and works with the child that has a hearing loss and needs intensive language and speech development because their speech and language develops. Yes. And so you could just tell the difference. Yes. When you compare them to those who are not getting it. Yes, and, and might I just say, just to encourage the audience, we, um, both Dr. Newbirth and us as speech therapists, we've seen any number of Bahamian children who are now doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, engineers, I mean, 
doing well in university abroad, I mean, taking on corporations and who were what Dr. Newbert, those would call severely or profoundly hearing impaired and you would never believe it, how yes. well they're doing because Absolutely. of the same thing she talked about. That's we have right. doctors here, we have local people here who you wouldn't even know that they were so challenged. That's right, absolutely. Thank you. So this question is for either Mrs. Langdon or Mrs. Bullard, whoever wants to answer. Does a child's ability to pronounce speech sounds affect their ability to read? Yeah, I think the answer there is yes, because if the child can't make the sound, um, it's going to have difficulty in, in reading. So I think that's another reason for um, identifying speech sound production um, as soon as possible. I don't know if you want to add anything, Mrs. Blood. She's muted. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So I have two more questions. And this one has to do with an idea that some parents have. It says, I have heard that you should not cut boy children's hair or else they won't be able to talk. Is that true? I think that's a, an old wives tale we'd say in England or Bahamian myth. Um, <laughs> It's just because of the time when you're maybe cutting the child's hair is about the time when his language is really taking off. So you tend to associate the two together, but it's um, a myth. Thank you. So the final question that I have here, and it looks like it's been repeated several times in different ways, reworded differently. There are people here who are interested in the field and they want to know how does one get into the field of speech language pathology and audiology? What does it take to become a speech therapist or audiologist? Go ahead, Ms. Langdon. <laughs> well, okay, to become a speech pathologist and to be able to practice, you need a master's degree in speech pathology which unfortunately isn't offered in the Bahamas as yet, um, but there are many online courses that you can probably do, but most um, speech pathologists who work in the Bahamas have trained usually in the United States, occasionally in Canada, or possibly in England. I don't know if Dr. Yeah, Newbus wants to say about can. audiology. Yeah, regarding audiology, you have to have a doctorate degree in audiology to practice as an audiologist. And uh, like Mrs. Langdon said, it's not offered here in the Bahamas, so it would mean that you would have to study abroad. Some of the some portions of it you could actually do online, and some of it you have to do um, practically on the location. And then in addition to that, you have, I think for both speech language pathology and audiology, you have to do a one year certification where you are yes. working in a medical facility or school or somewhere where you can do the training, hands-on training. And that takes an, an additional year in addition to your college programs. And yes. you can do that in the Bahamas because there are a number of us who are have a master's degree in our ASHA Certificate of Clinical Competence. So you can come back to the Bahamas and do that here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, let me just add to that. As much as we, um, we, um, we don't have a whole lot of it, but if you're looking at, let's say, if we look at real, just realistically being employed in the Bahamas as a speech language pathologist, you could start out as a speech therapist trainee or trainee speech language pathologist in the government system, in both Ministry of Health, no, not sorry, in Ministry of Education with a bachelor's degree, um, with the understanding that you do intend to go on and complete your degree if you want to practice within the Ministry of Education. But at this time, 
Um, our career paths do um, allow for persons to be hired as an assistant speech therapist or assistant speech language pathologist. That's not what we advocate, like Ms. Langdon said, but it's there. So I'm just giving you the information that's, you know, that's there. It's not the same for audiology. In audiology, you would have to have your doctorate degree to practice. Yes, and, and your, your scope of practice with a bachelor's degree, as you can appreciate, would be limited to the school system. And in our clinic, under strict supervision of the senior speech therapist. Okay, thank you. And I said that was the last question, but just to clarify, a question was asked, do speech therapists work in the hospital setting as well? Oh, most definitely. I'm sorry, I didn't make that um, very clear when I spoke. Most definitely. And we have it here at home as well. We have um, speech therapists who work at the private um, hospital, doctor's hospital, as well as Princess Margaret Hospital at the rehab center, um, where persons provide services, um, you know, the overflow services and those services that are not provided at the Ministry of Education or in private practice. Um, yes, and we also, um, yeah, we do have um, therapists who work in hospital and you, you are afforded that opportunity to choose if, if you go off to university um, to do your degree, your master's degree at least, um, whether you'd wanna specialize as a medical speech therapist along a medical track, or whether you'd want to specialize as a clinical or as a an education-based speech therapist where you only work in schools or in the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of Health um, speech therapy clinic. Um, but now we have persons who return home and some of them do just the medical speech therapy, yes. <clears throat> Okay. Well, panelists, thank you very, very much for taking the time out to be here with us today. I'm sure they all appreciate it. I see, I'm just making sure I'm not missing any other questions. Where can I go to apply to get my child's speech therapy? And this will be the final question. <laughs> this will be the final question before we conclude with our devotional thought. Okay, speech therapy, you can get assistance at the Ministry of Education. Um, we see school-aged children. There are several persons out there in the community who have, um, have their private practice and Go there, and then there is PMH. We have a the rehab center. You can get assistance there. And all the audiologists are private. So you have Dr. Scribbins, Dr. Newbirth, and Dr. Kenny. She's out west, that new hospital out west. Dr. Scribbins is at Doctor's Hospital. And Dr. New World has a private practice in Oaks in that's Oaksville? Yes, that's Oaksville. Oaksville. 24 Thompson Port. It's in Oaksville. It's if you know where Living Waters Church is, we are right off the same street where Living Waters Church is. Oh, and perhaps I should also say because there's such a shortage of speech therapists, there are long waiting lists. But if you have a child and you're really worried, just bug some speech therapists to give you some tips as to what you can be doing while you're waiting for a full assessment. Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Newberth, Ms. Sharon Clark, Ms. Thank Ferguson, you. welcome. Mrs. Bullard and Mrs. Langdon, Susan Langdon Battle. Thank you very much for giving us all of this information. I am seeing persons in the chat who are saying that they found the presentation to be very informative and they enjoyed listening to everything that was presented today. Um, 
Thank you to my fellow moderator and Monika Dean for helping me out with keeping track of all of the questions. Thank you, Tyler, um, for the preliminaries and DNL for the prayer. I appreciate each and every one of you. We are about to have our devotional thought by Elder Marvis David, but if, if our panelists can give their contact information. Dr. Newworth, I see you gave yours, but if we can give the contact for the speech therapy unit as well, I'll try to add that in the chat. We also have a Facebook page where we try to update it with tips and strategies regularly and information as to how you can send in a referral form Please keep in mind that the referral form needs to be sent usually by a teacher or a doctor or some other professional, but we do have access to our referral form there and you can get more information from there. So we will add all of that in the chat. Thank you participants for joining us today. I appreciate you taking the time out to listen to all that we had to say. And I hope that it was of benefit to you. So if Elder Marvis is ready, he can give the devotional thought and closing prayer. Okay, good evening everyone and happy Sabbath. Today we have heard from our health professionals on the topic, red flags to hearing, communication and academic success. My question to you today is what is our red flags to hearing and commun and communion with and com communicating with God? Let us pray. Oh Lord God Almighty Father, we thank you for the opportunity you have given unto us at this time to hear your word, and you have given to me the opportunity to share in this short de devotional thought. May you speak through me in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. 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 Just look around. Think about your life, your schedule, your friends and family. It becomes clear that many people today are busy. They rush about, preoccupied with personal job, family or business tasks, indulging in hobbies and pleasures. Yet, as a recent survey confirmed, nearly half of all adults admit that they do not have enough time to do the things they want to do. In the midst of a cramp schedule, we can wonder how God could fit in. Many take time for short prayer at morning or night or at meal. Some spend a few moments reading the Bible or devotional books. Others are content going to church once a week. But is this really the way we should act towards the Almighty God? The Bible says that we need to seek his kingdom first. According to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which says, but seek, first his kingdom, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. This means that God should be our highest priority. Seeking God shouldn't be an afterthought, but a dominant goal. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We, we also are commanded to be still before him, to take time to listen, to reflect on his word, to seek a still small voice. We cannot be, we cannot be still, we cannot be still if our minds are preoccupied by daily pleasures. How can we hear if we rush through a brief time of prayer or Bible reading? Sometimes because of 
all that is going on around us, if and among the boys and girls, our, 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 our children with school and extracurricular activities and then homework and then studying for tests, there is not enough time to, to communicate with God, to talk to God to prayer, to read our Bibles. Sometimes boys and girls will say, I did not study my quarterly because this week we have exams. The exam take the priority in our lives. Our job take priority in our lives. Sometimes we go as far because of time and we run out of time in the morning. We decide we'll do devotion on our way to our job, to our way to taking the children to school. So we will be there doing our devotion along the highway. But brothers and sisters, it says here, be, be still means eliminating distraction and focusing on God. It means waiting in his presence and listening to him. It means reading his word. And it means time of dedicated prayer and communion. So my question I'm asking myself, I have to focus on the traffic. And at the same time, I'm doing devotion while I'm going on the road. Is there... Is my thoughts and mind focused upon God? So with all of these distractions and red flags that we have there in terms of things that take away our time from God, we need to recommit back ourselves to God. The Bible reminds us that God longs to have an intimate relationship with us. This means we. He wants to speak to us. He wants to guide us. He wants to teach us new things and change our lives. Do not take God for granted. Make him your highest priority and be still before him. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving Father in heaven, Lord, we have thanked you for this afternoon program. We thank you for the professionals who have came on and who have guided us along the way in terms of what we need to do and what we need to look for in our children, even adults. And as I've learned today as teachers and myself as a teacher and pastors and preachers, what we need to do, Lord. We thank you for them and we ask you continue to bless them as they continue to, to work in this ministry of helping out our young people to be better learner and to be successful academically and also lord in the end result that they will become missionaries to go and share your word have that clarity that clearness to go and share their, your word not only throughout the bahamas but throughout the world we ask you lord to bless us and keep us all through this entire evening may you help us as we sleep or wherever we have to go may you take us all safe as you take us into this new week we say thank you and help us to have a very successful week, Lord. Please fill our hearts with your righteousness. Let your light continue to shine in and through us all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Marvis David. And thank you, those of you who stayed on to conclude with us for this, this Sabbath's program. I wish all of you a wonderful weekend. And since Monday is a holiday, I hope you're able to enjoy your holiday. May God bless all of you. Thank you again. I will stay on just a few minutes longer in case there's anyone else who would like to share their email address with me. But the meeting has now ended, so you are free to leave at this time.
Sister Brown, you did such a tremendous, excellent work this evening. And I just like how you keep your spirit so nice and calm and peaceful. That was so beautifully done. Love you. Take good care. Have a pleasant week. Thank you. Take care.